Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm going to share 10 expert level tips for how to use ChatGPT more productively. And by the way, everything I'm going to talk about in this video can be used totally for free. Oh, and by the way, if we haven't met yet, I'm Greg, I'm based in Switzerland. I used to be a strategy consultant and now I'm working full-time as an AI entrepreneur and YouTuber. On this channel, I share tips and tricks from my life and my experience, how you can use AI to be more productive. And with that, let's jump right into our 10 expert tips for today. Pro level tip number one is to use the ChatGPT desktop app instead of the browser window. To do that, you can just go here on the top right on your name and then you choose download the macOS app. There is an equivalent app for Windows as well. You download it and install it. You'll need to sign in again. I recommend you just use the sign in with Google. And as you see already, when you open it, you learn about some of the advantages of the desktop app versus the browser app, which is that you can get access to it from anywhere and you have access to keyboard shortcuts. So now I'm in the desktop app and I can use it just like the computer version. For example, by asking, how is Tesla stock doing today? And you see it behaves exactly how you would expect it, even though it got this particular answer completely wrong because Tesla is trading at $340 and not $210. Tip number two is to use a temporary chat so no information about your conversation gets stored or sent to anyone else. So you can keep things private. And the way to access this is by clicking here on ChatGPT and enabling temporary chat. And just like you would see in incognito mode in a browser, things turn dark. So you will always know when you're in a temporary chat. So you can, for example, ask questions like, where can I buy an engagement ring for my girlfriend? And even if she checks your ChatGPT history, she will never find out that you did this type of research. All right, and for tip number three, let's switch back to our normal mode. And that tip is to use one shot and many shot prompting. And these are fancy words, but what it means is basically that you give an example of a question and how the answer should look like. So for example, we give it this kind of task here. Classify the sentiment of a review as positive and negative. And what we do normally is just paste in the prompt as we would want it, and then ask for, for example, the sentiment. That's what is known as zero shot prompting, which is what, what most people do most of the time. But now to do one shot prompting, we can add an additional example so it knows how to behave. So here, for example, it gets the example, the product exceeded my expectations, highly recommended. So it knows it should classify this as a positive sentiment. And then it gets the task, the service was terrible and the staff was rude. And so if we send this, it already has an idea what it should do and it gives us the sentiment negative. And that's one shot prompting and we can make it even more accurate uh, with the case of many shot prompting. So if we take exactly this same idea here, instead of just one example, we simply give it three examples and then it can review this last task and be even more accurate. And you will see that in many corner cases, this is really helpful. So one example that I can share from my own experience when I built AI assistance, where I used this is when I had to classify the language. And it often gets confused. For example, if there is a sentence in English, but there is a single German word in there. And then it might classify that as German because usually everything is English and there is something different. So it gets classified as German. But if you teach it with an example that a sentence with one German word but otherwise English is still an English sentence, then it will also analyze the language correctly. That's one example where in my experience many shot prompting is really useful. And here are three, but you can go up to 10, 20 examples if you are making elaborate prompts that you reuse very often. All right, tip number four is that ChatGPT can actually read out its answers. And for that, let's go to a previous chat from my last video. And the way you do this is simply by going down below the text from ChatGPT here on this speaker symbol, 
and you can simply click on it. With a budget of $50,000, the Tesla Model 3 rear wheel drive RWD is- And you hear it reads out the answer aloud. And another additional trick here is that you can actually go into the settings. And if you go to speech, you can even choose what kind of voice you would like to have. You have like a two, four, six, eight, nine voices you can choose from. All right, and tip number five is that you can also switch the model by which ChatGPT answers your question. And the way you do that is by going on these two circling arrows, you click on switch models, and here you have the option of GPT 4O and GPT 4O Mini. Well, granted, right now this option isn't very useful because you always want to use 4.0 as long as you have it available. And if you don't have it available, you're forced to use 4.0 Mini. But probably in the future, OpenAI will launch more models and this option might be useful at that point to choose what exactly you want to have. Now, tip number four is a bit of a workaround. When you come in a situation where you use ChatGPT already a lot on a given day, and you can only use the weaker model because ChatGPT restricts you after a certain amount of usage. But you, for example, you want to upload a document here because you want to have it analyzed, but you can't do that on the weaker model. Then what do you do? Of course, OpenAI would like you to then pay the subscription, but there is a very easy workaround and that's just by logging out. And then you take another Google account and if you don't have one, you just make it for free and you log in with your other Google account that you just made. And as easy as that, you can just continue using the strong model. Pro tip number seven is to use ChatGPT to write code. So for example, write me some code for a mini game where I can play tic-tac-toe against a computer. And you can use that to design websites. You can do that to write Python scripts to analyze PDF documents. It depends a bit on your level of coding knowledge because if you have never done something like that, that's of course a bit tricky. But if you have minimal knowledge, it's amazing what you can do with just ChatGPT doing this coding for you. All right, it finished writing the code in roughly a minute. Let me copy and open that code to check if it worked. All right, and there you have it. Maybe the interface isn't the most intuitive one, but it works, let's play. So you see, I play the X, the computer plays the zero. And I win, nice. So that's how you can use ChatGPT to write code for you. Tip number eight is that you can connect ChatGPT with Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive for even faster data access. You simply click here on that paper clip and you choose add from Google Drive and you'll get access to your files. If you never did that, you need to connect first, but it's easy, like a Google sign-in. And you can just select the file and select it. And then you can simply ask here, for example, what do you see on this attached file? And the result is exactly the same as if you would upload this file from your computer. It's just faster and you can access it from anywhere. Tip number nine is that you can ask ChatGPT to analyze a conversation and tell you what's going on and, and help you fill in blind spots. Of course, you can do that for meeting notes, but one example how I used it just yesterday, for example, is to analyze a fight that I had with my wife and we used a chat app to have that. So it was easy for me to copy paste our conversation in there. And then I asked ChatGPT for uh, a neutral third point of view and also ask it for advice what actions I should take now. I'm not going to give you the details of the conflict I had with my wife, but it was really useful to get that input. And also we both laughed about it in the end. So if you ever come in that situation, I can only encourage you to try it out and see what advice it gives you. And then you can still decide to not listen to what it says if you think it's not useful. And tip number 10, I think is a really great one. And that is to have ChatGPT help you with your detailed travel itinerary. And let me give you an example here. So let's say I'm going to visit Switzerland. And then what I do is I actually give it the exact day and time and also place of arrival and the same with departure. 
I'm going to arrive on January 3rd, uh, 11 a.m. at Zurich Airport, and I am going to depart uh, on January, let's say, 9th at, uh, at 3 p.m. from Basel Airport. Please give me a travel itinerary for every day in Switzerland. And you can combine that with other techniques, such as asking ChatGPT to first ask you more questions to get to know your needs better. Or you can, of course, specify this prompt already better initially. But for the sake of this example, let's just have it in this uh, generic way. And what it does is it will basically give you very detailed ideas of what to do every day. And that maybe is not the best idea, but at least there is no idea where you don't know what to do. And it gives you very interesting starting points for how to plan a trip. All right, and that already brings us to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, you might also like to see 10 ChatGPT tips for beginners, which I'll link right up here. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you in the next one. Bye.